Hello, it's part four of the Robot Arm Project, which is a force-driven robot arm. So each of these hubs has springs in, and it can detect force on the hub, and that means we can do several things. We can detect how much force we're actually applying by measuring the difference between the motor encoder position and the actual hub position, i.e. measuring the spring stretch, and we can also drive it with force. So last time we managed to drive it backwards, by taking that difference and actually modifying the motor position and that means we can drag it all around for training and things like that and we can do that just by stretching these springs without having to back drive any gearboxes because they actively back drive based on the control electronics this time we're going to put the axis on that goes just here that goes up and down so that it can reach down and up and that's going to have the end effector or the gripper on it just a quick ad for my patreon campaign don't forget you can support me at patreon.com xrobots and you can get access to some exclusive rewards including a live stream with me all my videos early and sneak peeks and pictures of upcoming projects and if you don't like patreon i also have youtube channel membership so just click on that join button below don't forget my merchandise store where you can get open dog t-shirts and various other merchandise and various other designs so we've got to make an axis that goes up and down and it's also going to be force driven so it essentially needs to be two sliding stages one which will slide up and down on a motor so that we can raise that end effector up and down and another one within that that moves a little bit where we can measure the force again using springs and probably Hall effect sensors in this case. So we can try and measure how much of that's moving against the motorized sliding axis. Then we can work out the force that's being applied. So basically we've got two bits of V-slot extrusion, two stages with V-wheels, and we've got a motor mounted here which will have a pulley on. It should have a tooth belt but I'm going to start with a piece of string and there'll be a pulley mounted in the other end which is going to drive up and down the main axis. So let's print some parts and see what it looks like. So I've mounted my V-wheels which are mounted here and they're mounted on these plates with recessed heads and that allows another piece of V-slot extrusion to fit nicely in there and make a nice linear slider. And this is the piece that's going to measure force so we're going to have some sort of spring that holds it in the middle and it'll spring either way and we'll use Hall effect sensors to measure that distance. And now this piece slots into the V-wheels on the actual arm to make the main axis that actually goes up and down to lift the gripper. So mounted on there at the bottom is the motor and we're going to drive a pulley on there which is going to pull a cord around a pulley on the top and that's going to bring the axis up and down. So I just wanted to add a few words about the uh, wobble obviously as this thing's getting longer it's getting wobblier and it looks like it's really flexible and at the moment there's quite a lot of flex in these two bits of extrusion especially that way as this is bent so that is uh, one of the issues and I need to put an aluminium plate on there to hold that rigid and also we've still got quite a lot of gaps in the actual hubs here which I haven't shimmed yet so that needs to happen as well. But I'm going to build this axis, build the gripper, then we can assess the total mass and the total flex and we can decide what we need to do. So on the motor we've installed a 3D printed pulley and that's got a captive nut and a grub screw to hold it on the shaft and on top of that we're going to put this NinjaFlex 3D printed sock that's going to mean it can grab the string really well and this is a temporary solution eventually we'll put a toothed belt and a pulley on there at the top we've got another pulley which is just an idler and that's got bearings back and front on a piece of eight mil studding just like a skateboard wheel right so it's pretty crude but we've got a string it goes round the rubber roller several times and it's just tied off here onto this block with a zip tie to tension it eventually we'll replace that with something else like a nice tooth belt and a pulley but for testing, that seems to operate the axis perfectly well. So now we need to build the mechanism that measures the force in between the other two sliding axis. So basically when we drive it up and down, we can measure how much we're driving it. So I've designed this little mechanism with two fingers. So as we push this axis up, it's gonna push one of these fingers up. And that of course pushes it away from the other finger and the same in the other direction. And the fingers are gonna have magnets in, and these little recesses are going to have Hall effect sensors in, which are magnetic distance sensors that give us an analog value. So essentially, as we drive this axis up and down, the distance gets smaller or greater between the two fingers. We can tell which direction it's moving in and how far it's moving. And of course, we're going to spring those fingers together with these holes here and some springs. I mean, hopefully it snaps in the middle and of course it will rest on the bottom one more because of gravity. But I think that's going to be absolutely fine. Of course, we'll have to increase the springs as we put load on this axis when we put the gripper on. Uh, but for now, we'll just do a test. 
and hopefully I'll make that gripper quite lightweight anyway. So I haven't put the spring on yet, but obviously as I pull this down, one moves here and this one will move away from the magnet. And as we push up, it does the opposite thing. So the magnet that's embedded in the finger will move away from the whole effect sensor that's in the block. And that's how we're gonna measure the force. So the only problem I've got is though, as I come down here, while pushing down, yeah, this corner catches on the plate here and this does it on the top one. So I just need to round off those fingers and then we should be all good. Yep, so now we've rounded off all those corners so that they don't collide with that plate. And I've put the spring in, of course, now. So if we push that axis up, of course, one finger moves up. And if I pull the other one down, the other one moves down. I've also made this slightly longer so it locks in the middle properly, which means there's uh, really no play in that. So that seems to work pretty well. And now we can put in the Hall effect sensors in the gaps and measure the distance from those magnets. So those are my Hall effect sensors, two little transistory looking things that basically take 3.3 or 5 volts ground and give you an analog signal depending on how far away the magnet is. So we've got those just on a little breakout board so I can plug some pin strip in and we can run those wires up the arm to the teensy. I've attached my Hall effect sensors there and the magnet of course is in the finger. So that looks pretty good. And of course they move away from the magnets and I've got a little breakout board and I've strain relieved the cable here. So as this axis moves up and down, it doesn't strain the electrical connections. I've got this screened cable because we've got analogs to deal with and we've also got motor voltages and PWM shooting around. So yes, I have only attached the screen at one end and that goes to my Teensy. So that's my electronics now, it's my Teensy 3.6, all the previous wires for the encoders two per axis. This is now the screened cable with the ground attached at this end only. And we've got an additional motor driver, which is for that extra motor. And that's connected to some PWM pins on the Teensy there. So I'm reading those two values as analog ins there. So we've got them on two analog pins on the Teensy. And what I've actually done is inverted the magnet on one. So one is a high value and one is a low value. And one gets lower and one gets higher as the magnet moves away. So all I've done there is added the two together, taken off the offset. And if we now look at that in a serial monitor, we should be to see the values and they're the values on the far right here. So we've got one high value, one low value, and then basically both of them added together with the offset removed, which gives us something that floats around zero. And if we then move the mechanism up and down, we should find obviously one gets higher, one gets lower, and that offset goes negative. And if we move the other way, it should get positive. Whoops, just back driving the motor there. So that means we can calculate the force that's being applied. Obviously that spring stretches the more force we apply in either direction. So I'm now reading that motor encoder with another pair of interrupt service routines on those digital interrupt pins. So now as I drive the axis up, you should be able to see the value getting more negative, the very far right value that is, which is the encoder position as we go up. So that seems to be working pretty well. And of course the uh, value in the column to the left of that is the force and that gets more negative as well as we push up and positive if we push down. So uh, that's a pretty good match. And now we can do a PID controller to actually drive the position of that motor and then do something with the force value that we've got. So I'm just reading serial data now to try and get this PID controller sorted. So we're just reading the uh, position there, which shouldn't say shoulder, it should say slider. And then we're using that to drive a PID controller. So my set point, I'm actually constraining that value so I don't run my end stops, which is between zero and about 11,000. My input is the encoder position and we're doing a PID compute. The other one's here for the other axis. We're also putting a little filter on that. I haven't quite tuned the PID controller up properly, but it seems to work all right. Further down, we're using that value to drive the two motor PWM pins, basically, depending on whether the value is below zero or um, a positive value. So that drives the motor in each direction. And if it's zero, then it should turn the motor off altogether. So if we now open a serial monitor and start putting some values in, let's put in uh, 5,000, a minus 5,000 at least, followed by a character so it knows it's the end of the data. And we should find that goes about halfway up. I won't run it right to the ends, but if we do 10,000s, it should go up again. And obviously if we go back to zero, it should go uh, nicely to the bottom again. 
So now, of course, there's several things we can do. We can drive the axis to a position, but we can also measure the force. And of course, that's completely independent from that axis. With the other axis, we had two encoders and we had to measure the difference between them to work out what the stretch on the spring is. But using these Hall effect sensors and this simple mechanism, we just know what the force is straight away. So we could use that to measure the amount of force we're applying. And we can also use that to apply a certain amount of force by turning the equation the other way around. So we keep pushing the motor, basically, till that force measures a certain thing. We can also do what we did with the other axis in the previous episode where we're using that for training. So now we can actively back drive that axis by pushing it, measuring the force and cumulatively adding that to the motor so that on each cycle it repositions the motor as we push it round. And so we can use that for training as we can with all the axis to basically manipulate the arm into a position, save all those encoder positions and play them back later. So I've gone ahead and done just that. So on every cycle this force gets added to the motor position or subtracted. So if I uh, just show you I'm not actually pushing the motor backwards, so we'll just very gently lift this finger and lift the axis up, we can see it makes it go up. And if we let this drop down, then that should let the thing go down. And the arm is robust enough that I can just push the axis, so if I just push that up, or down like that, it will drive the arm. And of course the spring's pretty tough at the moment, but we do need to put the gripper on and whatever payload it takes. And of course all the axes are back drivable in the same fashion, so we can actually manipulate this whole arm now just by pushing it into position wherever we want. The motors will actively back drive. You can probably hear the PWM uh, tone there, which I still haven't tuned out properly, and I will do that when I've fixed all the gaps and put all the load on it. And of course all those axes can be manipulated and we can push them up and down and position them wherever we want really to train the arm to go to a certain position, perhaps over here. And let's just put that axis down a little bit. There we go. And then we could save that position in our code and we could play it back later. So pretty happy that that seems to be working. So next time we're going to be revisiting the gripper that I made in a previous episode. It's one of the first bits I made before I made this arm. Obviously it's the wrong colour, but more important than that, it doesn't measure force properly and the structure of it's wrong. So we're going to basically redesign that, also make it a bit finer, so it's got smaller fingers. These are a bit chunky than I expected. So it can manipulate things like sausages and eggs. So that's it for now. Don't forget to check back next time to see the whole thing in operation, hopefully. All right, that's all for now.